Okay, so today we are going to talk about chronic diarrhea workup. Diarrhea less than two weeks is acute. Diarrhea more than four weeks is chronic. In between, it can be both ways, either acute or chronic. We have a case here. A 55-year-old man comes to office with abdominal pain and diarrhea. His symptoms started two months ago after he recovered from an episode of acute gastroenteritis associated with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Initial labs, including blood counts, stool culture, stool ova, and parasites, are now negative. How will you proceed forward? If you look at this case, this patient presented with the chief complaint of abdominal pain and diarrhea. And if you look at his history, his symptoms started two months ago, and he also had an episode of acute gastroenteritis two months ago. But he recovered from that episode of acute gastroenteritis, but still for the last two months, he is having diarrhea. You suspected infectious etiology, and when you did the blood count, stool culture, stool ova, and parasite, they were all negative. That ruled out the infectious etiology. If it is not infectious etiology and this person is having diarrhea more than four weeks, it means it is a chronic diarrhea. How do you proceed forward? How do you investigate this patient and reach out the cause of this chronic diarrhea? Today we are going to discuss that. Whenever a patient with chronic diarrhea more than four weeks presents to you, the first thing you need to do is you have to rule out few causes. Rule out causes of acute diarrhea rule out some medications that can cause diarrhea, rule out lactose intolerance. You can simply ask the patient to stop taking milk for like 24 to 48 hours and see if he gets better or not. Look for history of gastric surgery. Look for any systemic disease that you think can cause chronic diarrhea. When you have ruled out all these causes, now you have to see what is the nature of diarrhea whether it is a bloody diarrhea or watery or it is a fatty diarrhea. Bloody diarrhea is quite obvious to diagnose. Patient will tell you himself that he is having episodes of bloody diarrhea. Between watery and fatty diarrhea, if you are confused, you can go for simple fecal fat and check the quantity of fat in stools. Now, if it is a bloody diarrhea, the next thing you have to go for, you have to do a pathogen screen you have to look for certain pathogens that can cause chronic bloody diarrhea. And when you go for pathogen screen, most probably in chronic cases, it will be negative. Then you go for colonoscopy plus biopsy. On colonoscopy plus biopsy, you will get your diagnosis. Bloody diarrhea can be caused by ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, ischemic colitis. So colonoscopy and biopsy will give you your diagnosis in the case of chronic bloody diarrhea. Coming towards watery diarrhea, in watery diarrhea, you have to look for two things. You have to check stool or smaller gap. Other than that, you have to look for response to fasting. Firstly, we'll discuss what is stool or smaller gap. Stool or smaller gap is basically a difference of the measured osmoles in stools minus the calculated osmoles. What are the normal measured osmoles in stools? That is 290 milliosmoles per kg. And how do we calculate it? Stool sodium plus stool potassium into two. Normal value of this difference is 50 to 100 milliosmoles per kg. Now you have to understand that there are two types of diarrhea. One is osmotic diarrhea and the other one is secretory diarrhea. What happens in an osmotic diarrhea, person takes food from outside environment and that food is not getting digested. That food is an osmotic agent and that osmotic agent attracts water from body and increases the water content in gut resulting in diarrhea. And if you examine that diarrhea, the major portion of the osmolarity of stools in osmotic diarrhea is not made up from sodium and potassium. The major portion of osmolarity in an osmotic diarrhea is contributed from the osmoles that a person was taking. The major portion of the osmolarity in osmotic diarrhea is contributed from osmoles that a person is taking, not from sodium and potassium. And sodium and potassium in the stools are low. If the stool, so, uh, stool sodium and potassium is low, the stool osmolar gap will increase. So if stool osmolar gap is greater than 125, it is osmotic diarrhea. 
what happens in secretory diarrhea in secretory diarrhea person is not taking any type of food from outside it's just simply due to any toxins or any hormones that is causing increased secretions in gut and those increased secretions in gut cause diarrhea and if you examine stools of a person with secretory diarrhea the major portion of osmolarity in an secretory diarrhea is contributed by stool sodium and stool potassium it's not contributed by any osmols from outside so stool sodium and stool potassium in secretory diarrhea will be high and in putting it in this equation if this value is high stool osmolar gap will be low so if it is less than 50 it is secretory diarrhea normally 50 to 100 milli osmoles per kg if greater than 125 it is osmotic diarrhea if less than 50 it's a secretory diarrhea in secretory diarrhea it can also be normal normal or less than normal this is secretory diarrhea now we have understood the concept of stool osmolar gap and we apply it in the watery diarrhea if stool osmolar gap is normal or it is less than normal or it patient does not improve with fasting it is a secretory diarrhea why patient does not improve with fasting because this patient is not taking any osmoles from outside the patient is not taking any food from outside it is basically a response to toxins or certain hormones that is there even with fasting and that is present even without fasting so that is secretory diarrhea now when you know that this patient has secretory diarrhea the next step is to go for pathogen screen endoscopy colonoscopy whichever way you want to go up and you have to check for hormone levels you have to look for these investigations and in these investigations you uh, find out the reasons of this chronic diarrhea it can be due to clostridium difficile toxins we talked about clostridium difficile in acute diarrhea and you should know that clostridium difficile can even cause a chronic diarrhea carcinide excessive production of serotonin from carcinide can cause diarrhea in carcinide vipoma watery diarrhea gastrinoma gastrinoma causes excessive secretion of gastrin and that gastrin causes excessive secretion of acids and those excess acids cause increased gut motility resulting in diarrhea hyperthyroidism can also cause increased gut motility and diarrhea coming towards other side on other side if the stool osmolar gap is increased it means that the person is taking food from outside that is not getting digested and that is acting as an osmotic agent attracting water and causing diarrhea and if patient stops taking that food person starts fasting he will get better because there will be no osmoles in gut causing diarrhea there is an osmotic diarrhea and in workup osmo osmotic diarrhea you can go for a pathogen screen endoscopy plus biopsy and for checking for confirming the lactose intolerance you can go for a hydrogen breath test whenever a person takes lactose and that lactose does not get properly digested it gets converted into short chain fatty acids and hydrogen gas that hydrogen gas is the one that causes bloating and that hydrogen gas you can detect that in the breath of a person and you can confirm the diagnosis of lactose those intolerance and most of the time you do not even need to go for this hydrogen breath test because if a person stops taking milk he gets better but if you want to confirm the diagnosis of lactose intolerance you can go for a hydrogen breath testing what are the causes of osmotic diarrhea it can be lactose intolerance a very important and a very common cause and laxatives and acids like the ones that contain magnesium coming to word fatty diarrhea whenever you want to confirm the diagnosis that this patient has a fat malabsorption syndrome the thing you can go for is a fat loading test in which you give 100 gram of fat per day and you collect the stools for the next 72 hours and in, in the stools you see the amount of fat present if the amount of fat in stools is less than 14 gram per day it means it's normal it's fine to have this much uh, fat in stools it is not fat malabsorption if the amount of fat is greater than 14 gram per day it means fat malabsorption is there it is significant and fat malabsorption can occur due to two conditions either the fat is not getting absorbed there is something wrong with the intestinal mucosa mucosa is is not properly absorbing fat or there can be problem with the pancreas since pancreas is involved in the digestion of fats through its secretions like pancreatic lipases whenever there is something wrong with the 
pancreas like in pancreatitis chronic pancreatitis the enzymes are not secreted and fat is not digested therefore that fat undigested fat appears in stools so to find out that whether it's the intestinal mucosa that is not absorbing fats or it is the pancreas that is not secreting the digestive enzymes we go for a test that is d xylose test what is d xylose d xylose are basically pre digested monosaccharides that does not require any action of pancreatic enzymes pancreatic enzymes have no role to play in the digestion of d xylose because it is already a digested food if that digested pre digested monosaccharides in d xylose get gets reabsorbed it means that the reabsorptive function is normal and if it does not get absorbed it means that it this reabsorptive function is not normal so if d xylose test is negative and d xylose is not absorbed it means that there is something wrong with the gut intestinal lumen it is not absorbing stuff properly and there is absorptive insufficiency to detect the cause of absorptive insufficiency you have to go for endoscopy plus biopsy on endoscopy plus biopsy you can find out causes like celiac disease tropical sprue whipple's disease that can cause absorptive insufficiency and if d xylose gets absorbed it means that intestinal lumen is normal intestinal lumen is absorbing everything it is basically the pancreas now who, which is not secreting Uh, digestive enzymes and fat is not getting digested that's why it's not getting absorbed so if if d xylose is absorbed absorptive function is normal it's the pancreas that is not secreting digestive enzyme and pancreatic insufficiency is resulting in in malabsorption of fats what are the causes of pancreatic insufficiency it can be cystic fibrosis if the patient is young or chronic pancreatitis in old patients so these are the causes of pancreatic insufficiency there is another test that you can use to detect pancreatic insufficiency and that is fecal elastase test what you do in fecal elastase is you detect the elastase enzyme secreted by pancreas in stools if it is absent it means pancreas is not secreting enzymes and it is pancreatic insufficiency fatty diarrhea is basically a malabsorptive syndrome in which fat is not getting absorbed and whenever fat is not absorbed it takes with it all the essential nutrition in the food as well so you should also go for cbc with all rbc indices because all those vitamins that are required for the normal growth of rbcs are also taken away with fat in stools you can also check calcium magnesium albumin and cholesterol levels you, if anemia is suspected check ferritin vitamin b12 and folate levels because fat malabsorption can result in deficiency of all these things then there is one more thing that i want to talk about and that is irritable bowel syndrome irritable bowel syndrome is basically a diagnosis of exclusion when you have ruled out all other causes of chronic diarrhea then you can diagnose a irritable bowel syndrome irritable bowel syndrome is an idiopathic disease and it is characterized by alternating diarrhea and constipation associated with pain so uh, it is it is also associated with psychological factor most commonly in middle aged women and if there is a roms criteria that you have to fulfill for diagnosing irritable bowel syndrome and in roms criteria you have the first point that is pain relieved by bowel movement patient has pain patient has diarrhea or constipation and whenever he passes he or she passes stools they get better so pain relieved by bowel movement and they have fewer symptoms at night diarrhea alternating with constipation if diarrhea is predominant you must go for celiac worker what is the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome high fiber diet is the first line treatment lifestyle changes high fiber diet is the first thing that you need to go and test patient on if patient does not get better with that you can also give anti diarrheas like loperamide if the diarrhea is predominant and you can also give laxative if constipation is predominant psychotherapy plus antidepressant play a major role because irritable bowel syndrome has an associated with psychological factors as well in summary 
whenever you suspect chronic diarrhea greater than four weeks, the first thing is to rule out all the causes of acute diarrhea, medication, lactose intolerance, history of gastric surgery and systemic illnesses. Then you look at the quality of the diarrhea, whether it is bloody, watery or fatty. If you are confused between watery and fatty diarrhea, you can simply go for fecal fat to check the amount of fat present in stools. When it is bloody diarrhea, straight away go for pathogen screen and colonoscopy plus biopsy on colonoscopy and biopsy you can find these diseases. In watery diarrhea, you have to look for two things, stool or smaller gap and response to fasting. If stool or smaller gap is normal and patient does not improve with fasting, it is most probably a secret secretory diarrhea and these are the causative agents of secretory diarrhea. Most commonly, uh, these are actually toxins of uh, certain bacteria and hormone levels can also be checked, but hormonal causes are very rare. If stool or smaller gap is increased, it means person is taking osmoles from outside and uh, if he stops taking them, he gets better. It improves with fasting. These are the investigations and lactose intolerance, laxative and acid containing magnesium are the causes of osmotic diarrhea. Osmotic diarrhea and fatty diarrhea are almost the same, but in fatty diarrhea, it, there is excess fat in stools and you go for, if you want to confirm it, that you don't normally go for a normal routine because history and everything suggests the cause of fatty diarrhea. So if you want to confirm it, you can go for fat loading test and you can go for desilose to differentiate whether it is absorptive insufficiency or pancreatic insufficiency and find out the cause. So this was chronic diarrhea. Check out my video on acute diarrhea. Thank you very much.